Hello and welcome. I'm David Edwards. This webinar is part of the Black Dog Institute uh, eMental Health in Practice series. And this series aims to familiarise our workers with online digital mental health and wellbeing uh, resources that are available in your day-to-day -day work. Just a little feature on this covering slide is our URL to some webinar resources, which we will refer to over the, the course of the webinar as well as a, a QR code, that little black box, which most people are probably familiar with uh, during this pandemic of hovering your smartphone over and allowing it to capture an image which will direct you to the webinar resource page. This code will appear a couple of times during the presentation, so don't panic if you don't get a chance to uh, get a shot on it. So this is Black Dog Institute webinar number 45, and it's titled Using Online Resources for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Mental Health and Wellbeing. So normally these webinars are designed for GPs and psychologists, but we've got the pleasure of having an all-Indigenous, all-star panel today. And the aim of this webinar is more for our frontline Indigenous workforce, but also our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters that work alongside us in uh, helping keep our mob uh, well So, as we would do for all meetings and cultural protocols, we're going to do an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'm a Waramai fella, so my mob are from down the Karua area, which is just north of Newcastle on the central coast of New South Wales. And I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country that I'm in today, which is Widjibal Waiwa country in Bunjalung Nation in Lismore, uh, northern New South Wales, in my native Gatang language given to me by my Uncle Stephen Brereton. So, Guji Yigu, Minyang Nyura Wobulin, Nyura Yigu Marala Baragu, Yi, Wijibu Waiabu Barai, Gatai Niran. So, welcome. And I'd like to acknowledge the country from which you zoom in today and its communities, as well as its elders, um, past, present, and future. I'd also like to acknowledge my uh, deadly panel of Indigenous uh, specialists in the mental health and wellbeing field, which I'll introduce shortly. And I'd also like to welcome all our mob out there that have joined us for this webinar, as well as our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters who work in health and wellbeing. So thanks very much for joining us. I'd like to also just give a shout out to Bronwyn Bancroft for the beautiful artwork that she's allowed Black Dog Institute to use. And, and uh, fun, funnily enough, Bronwyn's a Bundjalung woman, so that's really uh, fitting considering I'm sitting here in, in Bundjalung country. I'd also like to acknowledge the deadly team I work with um, who can't be with me in this room today, but I know they're hanging on the end of the line on the chat channel, and, and that's Judy Singer, Taylor Laurie and Shani Roberts, as well as Black Dog Institute GP um, Jan Orman. Um, just a little bit about me. I'm, I'm actually part of a team that's designed Australia's first uh, Indigenous-specific wellbeing website called WellMob. And I've done that through working with the national program of e-mental health in practice. And we've done that in collaboration with the Australian Indigenous Health Infonet, who many of you may be familiar with their portal. It's been around for about 20 years. And uh, as well as um, being part of MPRAC, I actually work for the University Centre of Rural Health in Lismore, which is a part of the University of Sydney. And along with our partners uh, with MPRAC, uh, Black Dog Institute, Menzies School of Health and QUT, we all work on uh, Indigenous mental health uh, and, and in the digital space. So that's what this webinar is largely about today. And before I wrap up our acknowledgements, it would be remiss not to acknowledge the deadly uh, Indigenous health and wellbeing workers that, that have actually been involved every step of the way of this new Indigenous wellbeing website called WellMob. And we had three reference groups of these Indigenous workers, one here in Lismore in beautiful Bundjalung country, one up in Darwin in Larrakia country in the NT that Menzies School of Health helped us put together, and one down in Ghana country in Adelaide through the South Australian Mental, uh, Medical Health and Research Institute that Menzies also helped us um, get together. So a big shout out to those groups that were involved in our Indigenous government, governance for the WellMob website right through to its design, the look, the feel, and the function. So thanks heaps, guys. This webinar is also for you. So what are we going to yarn about today? Well, we're here to talk about what digital wellbeing resources are out there to help maintain our, the wellbeing of our mob. We're going to have a look at where you can find them in a new one-stop shop of these resources called WellMob. 
And we're going to yarn with our deadly panellists about how they can be used in our communities by our workers and to maintain our own health and wellbeing. Just a quick disclaimer about digital, social, emotional wellbeing and mental health tools. Obviously, they don't replace our workers and we hope that these tools will be useful in putting in their toolkit rather than replacing um, faces, which is, we all know is so important with our mob. Also, a disclaimer that these digital resources we'll talk about are generally for low intensity mental health interventions and not for crisis support or uh, acute mental health illnesses. So I'm going to get on to the business of introducing our deadly panellists today. We've got Nathan Brams Bramston, a, a, a deadly Wanneroo Wana fella. He works at Headspace as a national manager of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Cultural Practice and Engagement Program. We've got Samantha Wild, a, a young Indigenous leader in mental health and wellbeing, a Waka Waka uh, uh, Cobble Cobble woman. So we're going to talk to, to Sam, who's a consultant of Awakening Cultural Ways. And last but not least, we've got Tiani Schaefer, uh, a, a Kolkadoon woman who manages the iBobbly program and the social, social emotional wellbeing uh, program of Black Dog Institute. So I really welcome and appreciate um, and feel honoured to be in this space with uh, you people. So I might um, give you a chance to, to tell us about yourself and uh, I'll just introduce from left to right Nathan Bramson, starting with you, besides being a, a deadly new dad and um, uh, a fellow that's working at Headspace. Nathan, can you tell us a bit about you and also what got you into mental health and wellbeing and working there at Headspace. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, hello, Anakani, everyone. Um, as Dave mentioned, I'm a wonderful fella, so I'm also originally from um, up in the Valley of New South Wales and currently living and working on what we call the Mwamai countries. Um, Dave told you a bit about my role at Headspace. Um, for me, what got me into working in mental health is, is obviously um, you know, just sort of witnessing a lot of mental health um, through family and, and young people, you know, throughout my sort of youth journey when I was a young fella. And, uh, you know, losing a couple of long, uh, young people along the way, unfortunately. So what really sort of sparked my interest is, is wanting to, I guess, get myself in a position where I can, you know, try and have the most amount of impact and influence change where I can. And, and, and obviously in the mainstream sector, because um, we know that our community control sectors are doing deadly as well. So... Um, yeah, that's what got me to, drove me to where I am now. Eh? Thanks, Nathan. It's great to have someone who's looking out for our diverse young mob out there through the services of Headspace. And over to Samantha Wild, a, a Waka Waka Cobble Cobble woman um, who, who's the senior consultant for Awakening Cultural Ways. Some, most people will be probably familiar with Sam through her work in mental health and wellbeing and uh, the health services. I'd just like to add Sam was our chairperson for the new WellMob website on the steering committee, so we really appreciated Sam's involvement in development of this website. So, Sam, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you're up to in the mental health wellbeing space. Thanks, Dave. Um, at the moment, I'm an Aboriginal consultant and I work um, across a range of, of research and community consultations in quite remote areas and um, in regional and urban areas as well. I, um, I work in this space, particularly in mental health, around acknowledging the strength of cultural healing and wellbeing and trying to find the best of both worlds approach in the mental health response to our mob. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Dave, that Dave has really been driving the development of WellMob and he has been amazing and I'm very privileged that he has put his heart and soul into this. So thank you, Dave. Thanks, Shane. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Um, really great to have you here. Uh, our last but not least, our other panel member, Tiani Schaefer, who's a Kolkadoon woman working on the iBobbly app and social emotional wellbeing program of Black Dog Institute. Tiani, can you tell us about yourself? I'm pretty impressed with your CV, seeing it on the bio there of the webinar. Um, what got you into mental health and, and tell us about all those deadly qualifications you've got or getting? Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, so as Dave mentioned, my name's Tiani Schaefer. I'm a proud Calgarine woman from Mount Isa, Queensland, and I'm currently living, working and studying on the beautiful Gadigal land here in Sydney. Um, I'm doing about to finish my master's in suicidology and um, also doing my honours fourth year in psychology. So I guess what got me into the mental health and suicide prevention area, I think um, growing up, especially in rural and remote communities, I really did see firsthand the effect that suicide has on our mob and our community. And I really wanted to upskill my knowledge um, so I could take 
part and play a key role in helping our younger generation and our young mob improve their social emotional well-being and but also I guess um you know teach them different strategies and ways that they can handle what's going on for them and situations that they may find themselves in I guess um they are the future leaders especially in this space so I think it's really important that they have all the tools in place um, so that they can be strong, capable leaders uh, with strong minds and, and navigate anything life chucks their way. So that's a little bit about me. Thanks, Tiani. Talking about future leaders in this space, I think I've got a panel full of them, so I feel very privileged today. So what do we hope you will learn today? Um, by the end of this uh, webinar, we're, we're going to showcase some really important digital wellbeing resources that can play a role in keeping our mob well. As we said, they're not the only thing, but in this pandemic era, we know we've relied on digital uh, resources because we can get them 24 seven. Um, we're gonna get to identify how to use these, the new WellMob website that we'll actually demonstrate or a colleague of mine will demonstrate through a pre-recorded um, video. And we're going to get some tips and tricks from our panelists uh, about how to use digital wellbeing resources in your work because it's great to have them now in the one spot under the wellmob.org.au website. But it's another thing about using them in your work and, and uh, integrating them into your practice. So hopefully you'll get some uh, insights into that. Okay, so just to make sure we're on the same page, what do we mean by digital social emotional wellbeing resources? It's a bit, bit of a tongue twister and I've, I've twisted my tongue a few times already. I apologise. But most of us are pretty familiar with what digital wellbeing resources may be out there, but some, some people are new to the game. So let's just go through them quickly. I guess a lot of us are probably familiar with some of the more evidence-based uh, online digital resources, such as apps, websites, and uh, online programs. And I've got some examples up there with the, uh, for the apps, I've got the Stay Strong app, which is a, a deadly app uh, developed by the Menzies School of Health. Um, that's a real strength-based uh, goal setting tool as well as the new iBobbly app from Black Dog, which is a free app for Indigenous um, people to self-manage their wellbeing, and Tiani's going to give us a, a, a good rundown of that. There's also a websites and portals. I mentioned the Australian Indigenous Health Infonet portal before, but also there's the Gaia Dewey Proud Spirit Australia portal, which is a great repository of resources for our mob to cope with the pandemic. So check that one out um, if you're looking for some resources for your community to get through this tough time. And online programs, an example was the Mindspot uh, Wellbeing, uh, Indigenous Wellbeing Program, which is an eight-week program for 18-year-olds and up. But some of the other digital resources out there, I guess I call the grey material or the informal uh, digital materials such as videos and audio, uh, as well as positive social media sites, I think they're becoming more and more uh, used by our workers out there to connect with their Indigenous clients. And I guess we all know that... Um, our culture is a very narrative-based culture and so to see someone having a yarn about a, a, a mental health and well-being issue can empower us and give us a bit of an objective view of what might be going on for ourselves. Also, um, I guess our young people gravitate to this material, whether it's on YouTube or, or podcasts. It's easily accessible. You can play it while you're driving, hopefully not watching a YouTube clip, but you can get a sense of um, a lot of content by just informally or casually absorbing it through your, your headphones or watching your screen. So we'd really like to focus on some of this informal grey material of videos and audio um, resources during this webinar. Um, I might just uh, hand over a very quick question to Tiani Schaefer at Black Dog Institute because I, I kind of think to really... Um, uh, strengthen this point about audio and visual material. Like Tiani, I see the iBobbly app is very orientated to our mob in terms of the visuals and, and some of the little audio grabs you've got on there. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Because I know it's a, it's a great uh, way to overcome some of the literacy barriers in some of our communities that have had educational disadvantage and, you know, maybe English is their second or third language. So I'm really impressed by the iBobbly app. Um, could you tell us about those sort of visual and audio cues that you've designed in the app, um, which I know you'll talk to a bit shortly? Yeah, so I guess um, our partners, Alive and Kicking Goals, based in Western Australia, Room, um, played a really key, key role in ensuring that um, iBobbly was culturally informed and safe um, and that it really had culturally engaging artwork, um, Aboriginal metaphors and our icons and also... Um, Local mob um, from Broome, actually a male and female, recorded their voices. So, you know, it's it's great to see that I probably, you know, 
you can really connect with those young people and feel like you're having a yarn with someone. Um, and I guess it's really easy to use no matter if, you know, what your knowledge is in technology or even what your, as you said before, your written literacy level is, level is as well. Fantastic. I can't wait for us to show our deadly webinar um, participants out there the iBobbly program that you'll talk to shortly. But before you, you, we do, we might just have a look at an example of a, a video that it does um, capture a, a very important mental health message in it. And it's by uh, Brother Joe Williams. Um, for those who may be familiar with Joe, Joe um, is a, uh, a national boxing champion and also a, a, a very talented NRL player. And now he talks about his mental health and well-being as, as part of the enemy within um, a suicide prevention and uh, well-being educational program. So let's hear from Joe Williams on his story. My name's Joe Williams. I'm a First Nations Wiradjuri man from, uh, from Australia. And I've lived as a professional sports person for the past 15 years, but involved in sport my entire life and lived with mental illness my entire life. Um, only, I guess I only really knew it was mental illness in 2009 when I was diagnosed, um, but I I'd, I'd lived with a, an inner dialogue in my, in my head uh, my entire life. I knew that that was gonna be, it was gonna end poorly. So I decided to, to give away alcohol and drugs and anything that come with it. It's almost 11 years um, that I've been completely clean and sober now, but by taking out the substances that I was putting to quieten down the noise, up turns the volume on the noise. So I had to really, I had to, I guess, uh, learn about what I was going through. And learning about what I was going through started to learn about myself, but also educate me about the mental illness I was diagnosed with, and that was bipolar disorder. So I'm about to hand over to Tiani Schaefer again from Black Dog Institute to give us a bit more info. Now she's um, given us a bit of a taster for the iBobbly app to talk about its um, capability and its, uh, its visuals and, and audio um, functions. So Tiani, would you like to tell us about iBobbly? Sure. Thanks, Dave. Um, so I guess thinking about the differences in how Aboriginal and Toshana Shana people understand their social emotional well-being and, and what impacts it, it's really important that we have culturally appropriate tools and apps available. And that's where apps like iBobbly come into the picture. Um, they play a really, really helpful role in helping us overcome different issues such as costs, feelings of shame, lack of services. And in some instances um, where those young mob may have family members working at the Aboriginal medical services and they may be too shamed to go into those services. Um, so iBobbly is a good start in that sense. So what is iBobbly all about? Um, it's a free social and emotional wellbeing app for young mob age 15 and plus. Um, and it helps by, you know, it helps people feeling down, sad, or even just for those uh, young people who want to learn different strategies um, for coping. And when I say young people, um, uh, my nana also likes it as well. So you don't have to be young to use iBobbly. Um, it's anonymous and assuming the young person has some data, it can then be accessed anywhere at any time. Um, and I should note that once you initially download it, you don't need um, Wi-Fi or data or credit to use it. And it can be downloaded in both the Google Play Store and the App Store. So I might just play a quick um, promo video of a little bit of background about iBobbly. iBobbly has been designed to help young people like you to manage sad and worrying thoughts. Developed by experts in the field and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from your communities, it's been specifically designed with your needs in mind. It helps by showing you ways to manage your thoughts and feelings, as well as how to decide what is important in your life. Importantly, everything that is seen, heard and experienced in the app is shaped by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community members to ensure that iBobbly is culturally informed and safe. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists and graphic designers created new artwork for the app. Young people gave advice on what language to use and local people gave their voices for the audio recordings and stories. Using the app will feel like you're having a yarn with a family member. When young Indigenous people from the Kimberley tested iBobbly for just six weeks, they said they felt much better after using the app. So if you've been feeling down or having thoughts of hurting yourself, give iBobbly a try. It might just be the support you need to get yourself feeling deadly again. But remember, 
If your thoughts of suicide or hurting yourself are stronger than you feel you can control, there's no shame in seeking help and it's important that you talk to someone as soon as possible. Click on the help icon in the top right hand corner of the iBobbly homepage for a list of help and support options you can contact anytime. It's a great little video, um, Tiani, and, and a great snapshot of what iBobbly can do. But can you tell us a little bit more about some of those functions? Yeah, so um, as on the screen there, you can see there's four, I guess, main components within iBobbly. The first section is um, is a quick self-assessment to see how the user's tracking. And they can go back in, just say, for example, they go in and check in to see how they're feeling this week. Um, you can actually go back into the app and see how, you know, your feelings may have changed over time. And if your feelings have decreased or um, you may be, may be a good sign to reach out for further help as well. The second component is the stuff I can use section. And this teaches a user how to really, you know, manage those thoughts and feelings um, and helps the user identify those characteristics that they want to stand for and en encourages them to set realistic and positive goals. The third component is the how I'm going to beat this section. Um, and this section really helps the user create their own personalised action plan for getting on top of what they're feeling and um, dealing with those troubling thoughts and feelings. Um, and the main component of this I really like is that the user can really input whatever they think is helping. So not from not just from, just from like what they learn from the app, they can also input anything that has previously helped them as well. Um, and it also shares uh, different practical sh coping strategies for managing how they're feeling and also audio recordings of personal stories of real life people sharing their story of hope as well. So overall, there's about 17 different activities within the app and eight different videos. Um, so now I just wanted to share just a little bit about um, iBobbly and some tips um, the young person can use. But it's important to note that um, iBobbly isn't always a complete solution and any additional support from yourself, family, carers, uh, or other health professionals really has great potential in terms of what the young person can actually get out of using the app. So firstly, familiarizing yourself with the iBobbly app clearly demonstrating that you know what's in the app um, and that you think it's helpful is a great first step in building that confidence with the young person. Secondly, building cultural confidence in iBobbly. So as I mentioned earlier, everything that is seen and heard in the app um, will feel like you're having a yarn uh, with a family member or someone you trust. So just sitting down with the young person as well and helping them download the app um, and get started is also really helpful, especially if they can use your hotspot to download the app. Um, young people like to keep that credit, so um, that would be of great assistance as well. If it seems like the young person is getting nervous or uncomfortable, suggest looking at it um, another time together, or they may want to download the app and check it out themselves. And if that's the case, um, let them know you that, that they can talk to you about what they learned from the app as well. And lastly, I guess really encouraging to the young person um, that to continue using the app whenever they're feeling sad or down even if it's 1 a.m. in the morning, um, to give iBobbly a go. Uh, so I guess that's all from me today. Um, my uh, email address is on the bottom of the screen there, so please um, get in touch with me. I'd love to hear from you all and uh, see how we can potentially work together to incorporate iBobbly into your services, even in those some regions um, you know, where young people might not have smartphones. Um, I'm more than happy to see if I can come in or do a webinar like this today um, and work out how a young person can use it, I probably, and go through some of the activities um, more so in a paper-based version. Thanks, Dave. Thanks so much, um, Tiani. It's, it's a really deadly app, I probably, and it's great that even nanas love it. Um, I, I really like that. Designed for young people, but used by nanas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd like to sort of move on to uh, after seeing some examples of digital wellbeing resources in, in the iBobbly app and uh, Brother Joe Williams's video. I'd like to sort of explore this concept of Indigenous wellbeing because I kind of think it's really important, particularly for our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters that are working with our mob, to get their head around just how our wellbeing is made up of more than just mental health. And to do that, I'd like to just explore the model that you can see on the right-hand side of your screen which a lot of people might be familiar with. It was put together by Guy Dudgeon and, and others. And uh, 
a colleague of mine, Simon Dubois, who's a psychologist and used to work in youth services um, and, and joined in on a webinar last week on this topic, he describes it as a, a wheel. And I like this analogy because at the hub of the wheel is Indigenous holistic social emotional well-being. And radiating out from that hub are all the factors that influence well-being. And they're like the spokes of the wheel. And that's connection to country, to culture, to kin, to community, but also just uh, physical and mental health and well-being are just part of that picture. And then on the outside of the wheel are all those things that have and continue to influence our well-being, the, the social, cultural and political determinants, and I would add economic determinants. I think it recognises that these factors of our well-being have been impacted by policies of the past and ongoing events and they continue to shape our well-being today. The main sort of take-home message from this model is I think that mental health is only a component of Indigenous well-being and I think it se separates us from our non-Indigenous Australians that our connection to culture and country and, and our spirituality is such an important part of our health and well-being. And I'd like to sort of ask Sam Wild a bit of a question around this because I know Sam aspires to this model and the work that she does through her consultancy. Sam, can you tell us, does this model of holistic social and emotional well-being really, why it sort of resonates with you? Absolutely. So this um, social emotional well-being framework was developed by a group of Indigenous psychologists to showcase the complex nature of social emotional well-being in contrast to the Western model of mental health. So because it was developed by our own for us, it definitely is a model that sits comfortably in a community setting um, and working for me as an individual in my community. So that was originally adapted from um, a model developed in Canadian First Nations. However, in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander social and emotional wellbeing framework, it really does show the interconnectedness of our connection to place, to our community um, and to our culture as, as really distinguishing features of wellbeing. Thanks very much, Sam. I, I think it's really important to set the scene with this holistic model of wellbeing because this was the framework we used for the development of the new Indigenous-specific wellbeing website called WellMob. And why did we develop this new website called WellMob? Well, a bit of background before we give you a demonstration. The need for this website came from you, our frontline Indigenous wellbeing workers. What we heard through our previous training in this space of digital wellbeing uh, resource use with your Indigenous clients was our practitioners and, and workers said mainstream mental health websites and resources just don't work for us, Mob. You know, they're just not culturally relevant. They're, they're designed for mental health workforce and not community support workforce. So we've tried to look what is out there in terms of digital uh, social emotional wellbeing for Indigenous people and put it together in the one spot. That was really important because that was the other message we heard from our workforce, that trying to find some of these Indigenous-specific wellbeing digital resources was like trying to find needles in haystacks. And by putting them together in the one spot, it takes out the, the pain of having to do a, a Google search and get 100 hits. And some of it, you know, is more that sort of deficit-based resource or the, the rats and stats of how our community are facing, um, you know, lots of health challenges. So what we've been able to do is pull them all together for our workers to make it easy for them to access. So... I'll about, I'm about to give you a quick demonstration, or my colleague Shani Roberts is about to give you a pre-recorded demonstration on the WellMob website. But just in a nutshell, the WellMob website is a library of existing digital wellbeing resources for our mob. So we actually didn't go out and create any content and hats off to all the mob that did because we just pulled it together. And it links to their websites or their social media or uh, multimedia accounts so it makes it easy for you to access Who's it for? It's principally been designed for our frontline Indigenous workforce and their clients, but we've also um, had input from GPs and allied health professionals as to make sure it's a really useful tool for them to better engage with their Indigenous clients because it's a great way for them to have a yarn around a, maybe a difficult topic like substance misuse by just looking at a video or, or talking through a, a resource um, while they're in session. And thirdly, I mentioned before, a big shout out to its development was really a credit to our three reference groups in Darwin, Adelaide and, and Lismore, but also it was a collaboration between our electronic mental health and practice team here, as well as the Australian Indigenous Health InfoNet. 
So without further ado, I'm going to give you a, a very quick uh, video uh, that's developed by Shani Roberts. So let's explore the WellMob website together by simply searching www.wellmob.org.au. As you can see, the WellMob home landing page has a simple layout and is culturally inviting with Aboriginal artwork by Aboriginal artist Francis Bell Parker, a descendant of the Yagle people. WellMob has normal features that includes the About tab, contact links, get help when in crisis link, and a search function. The main feature of WellMob is its app-like appearance with six icons representing six main topics that you can find wellbeing resources under. These are mind, body, our mob, culture, keeping safe and healing. You notice that the website is based on a holistic model of Indigenous social and emotional wellbeing and captures many of different things that make up our health and wellbeing, not just mental health. The website is designed to find resources within just three clicks. For example, if I click on mind, it takes you to the subtopic page. On the subtopic page, you'll find a range of issues that are related to keeping a healthy and strong mind. And when I click on a subtopic such as worries, I'm directed straight to a page with multiple resources under worries. On the left hand side here, I'm able to filter my search by the condition type, language, resource type, such as videos, websites, audio, apps, even documents. Target audience and age groups. If I click on a resource, I'll arrive at, a, at the resource whether it's a website, app, video, podcast, you'll see on the left-hand side here that there are descriptors in plain language, such as what it is, who's it for, where's it from, which gives me a good indication about what the resource is about. And if I click on the link, it opens up the resource on the same page for me. To further explore, click on www.wellmob.org.au. Thank you for tuning in. Too deadly, Shani. I, I love that demo because the, the real take home message is there is that within three clicks, you should be able to find the digital or on, online resource you're looking for. And that once you do get there, there's a very simple plain language descriptor of what is it, who's it for and where's it from, which is what our, us mob always ask when we're look, talking to people. So hopefully that resonates with uh, our workers out there. So I'm going to uh, hand over to our next panellist to talk uh, about um, a very deadly new space uh, shortly uh, on Headspace. And uh, Nathan Bramston, I also wanted to sort of give you a bit of a, a lead-in, brother, by um, just asking you, like I, I know Headspace have... have uh, um, got into this social emotional well-being space with a new web page but just from personal experience um, I know firsthand that you're into connecting with your culture what sort of online resources do you use to, to maintain your well-being? Yeah um, I guess it's been now more than ever I've actually started to turn to it like with, with COVID and um, you know got a young family not getting out of the house as much so um, for me, like I've got a few apps that I've downloaded, you know, like there's language apps. So, you know, one of that language app, which I think is really helpful around, you know, reclaiming our language and identity that way. So, um, and, and then trying to bring that into my everyday life. So that's um, something pretty deadly. And, you know, there's a fair few different language apps out there um, available. Um, you know, listen to music, Spotify, there's heaps of deadly black playlists there. And, you know, sometimes you need that motivation and that connection and, um, yeah, so that, that's sort of some of those things that keep me strong and, and also some of those, 
YouTube clips of our elders sitting down having a yarn and, and sharing stories about country and, and, you know, that's the stuff that sort of keeps you strong and connected and motivated to look forward instead of back. So, Yeah, thanks, my brother. And, and like, you work for Headspace and, like, I always think about Headspace, Young Mob, always think it's a mainstream, uh, you know, mental health service provider, but I've, I've learned a lot more over the years about how, um, they're doing a lot more in the space with our mob. Can you tell us a bit about uh, Headspace and how they're working with our mob? Yeah, sure. So, so obviously Headspace, you know, we have about 100 centres across the country in regional remote areas and, and they're popping up um, even more frequently now. Um, you know, it's really targeted around you know, young people aged 12 to 25 and essentially it's around, you know, getting sure, making sure that they have access to the mental health, wellbeing support, if that's other support around, you know, getting back into work and study, getting their physical health checks, that sort of stuff. Um, and we also have our online services, um, you know, that's uh, focused around vocation, you know, getting back to employment, um, as well as a headspace, which is almost like a virtual, you know, headspace centre um, online and over the phone. Um, there's a pretty cool little program that's happened recently. It's uh, called Yarn Space, which is a bit of a group chat. Um, so that's actually peer moderators by, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people who are moderating group chats and, and connecting with other Aboriginal young people. Um, so that's just one example of, of how we actually, you know, give young people the power and influence to, to actually deliver services and, and support our young mob. Um, you know, historically we've had campaigns um, that I know Cement the Wild was a part of with the developing yarn safe. Um, you know, that was a real deadly campaign that, that was sort of the first of its kind and that was really co-designed with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people from around the country. Um, we've got a lot of resources that have sort of come out of that um, and we're in the process of developing a new campaign because it's been about five or six years now. So we want to make sure, um, you know, that it's relevant that we're, you know, now getting in touch with those younger mob now who were outside of that 12 to 25 um, you know, age range and, and, you know, working with them and Tiani and Dobby in and Faye under there. But Tiani's been deadly at, at helping us with that as well. I thought I'd move on to the video that Headspace um, have got there about Taz's story. And Nathan, could you give us a bit of an intro to Taz's story? Because you, you caught up with Taz recently and had a yarn. And yeah, what's, what's some background here, brother? Yeah, so Taz is a, a young brother boy, um, you know, he'll, he'll introduce himself in a tick. Um, again, this is an example of an online resource that Headspace has developed around sharing those stories and yarns and experiences of young people, which is good for other young people, I think, to actually go, actually, that's, that's me, I can resonate with that. But as well as, on the other hand, to help educate, you know, the workforce side of things. Um, but, yeah, on a side note, Dave caught up with Taz recently and, and um, it was really good to have a yarn with him. But just seeing him and, and watching this clip again just reminded me on, on how strong and, and dirty our young people are and, and, you know, how, you know, when you actually reach out and get support, what an impact that can make. So I'll let Taz share a bit more about you. But, yeah. Thanks, Nathan. Let's hear Taz's story. I'm a brother boy. My brother boy is a Indigenous female and male trans person. I'm from Townsville. My tribes are Kalkadoon, which is Mount Isa, and Boogerman, which is Palm Island. I guess growing up, I had feelings of wanting to be a guy, but I didn't know anything about it, so it was a bit pointless me trying to say something that I didn't understand. I didn't want to talk to anyone about it because I didn't want to tell them, hey, you know, I've got an issue with my gender. The family I was living with after I had come out as same-sex attracted ended up kicking me out and I ended up in a shelter. After I'd been kicked out, I got a phone call that my mum had passed away in a car accident, which had quite a profound effect on me. It kind of just felt like my whole world had fallen apart. I guess I figured that the best way to deal with it all was to get drunk, to get high, so I just wouldn't have to deal with anything. Without knowing it, I had a male spirit all along, which meant my inner self, you know, they were like, no, you know, you don't really, you don't really identify as what your body looks like. That was like my inner spirit telling me that's who I was. Wow, that's a mad video and what a what a empowering uh, story from that young person. Really appreciate uh, Taz sharing that with us by recording a video. Thanks very much, Nathan, for 
talking about Headspace and its Indigenous uh, programs and sharing Taz's story. What we thought we'd do now is actually have a bit of a yarn about how you can use some of these uh, digital or online resources out there for, uh, for the wellbeing of our mob and just have a quick overview of some tips and tricks from our, our panellists. Um, so how can you use them in your work? It's great. We know about some of these resources now and that, that WellMob is the repository of them. But how would you actually integrate them within your, your work or, or in your practice? I guess the most important thing that um, I've learned in, in my sort of uh, short career in digital well-being is about you've got to understand the technology. And, and I've been, <laughs> been a case in point today trying to get the audio to <laughs> work. But really with a client-based role, it's really important to understand if they're using a smartphone or maybe they don't have access to that or they have a shared phone amongst the family. So maybe a PC or at the school or at the library is, is more important. So you've got to know what they're using as to know what resources they can use because obviously an app isn't going to work on a PC. It needs to work on a tablet or, or a, uh, a smartphone. So having a yarn around what they're using, um, a lot of people have brought up in the chat room about Wi-Fi accessibility and the cost of downloads. That's another big issue. And a lot of our communities, and particularly rural or remote communities, Wi-Fi access is an issue. And uh, we know a lot of our mob are on dial-up, uh, uh, prepaid sort of uh, type of low, lower levels of uh, internet access. So I think that's really important to know. Uh, and, and Tiani talked about iBobly being um, available offline. So that's a really important uh, attribute of that app. I think the other thing is just understanding how you might be able to use a resource here in session if you're having a, a counselling based sort of role or discussion with a person. You know, you can say, hey, I noticed you're a gamer. You know, what sort of games you're playing? And it can just a segue into other digital wellbeing resources because we know, you know, there's lots of pros and cons of gaming. But again, it's just about trying to create a safe space um, to have a yarn around technology and what type of digital um, positive tools are out there to help uh, with, with our wellbeing. Um, I mentioned uh, my colleague Simon Dubois before, who's a, a psychologist. He talks about making sure before his Indigenous clients walk out that door, they've either bookmarked or saved a resource or have a, a URL link to it so they've got it on their device or in their hot little hand so they can access it. Because I think it's really important that they take it away then and integrate it within their wellbeing practice um, and not just explore it within session. And the other little tip he gives is make sure they use um, some of those simple features of our smartphones such as reminders and calendars to organise their lives and maybe take out some of that other clutter that's going on and, and even if it's just a reminder to attend their next appointment to set a, um, a set of actual uh, reminder notice. So I'm going to uh, share an audio resource with you today. Um, we've been very visual based um, and given our culture is very uh, linguistic and very audio based. So I'm going to share a, a, an audio grab from a colleague of mine, a UN woman called Candice Angelo, who's um, actually working at the University of Sydney as an Indigenous lecturer in uh, health promotion. But she's also a, a registered nurse on a, a North Coast hospital. So I'm going to share uh, her story about using a particular app for young people that present to the emergency department of hospital. Hi everyone, my name is Candice Angelo. I am a UN woman, proud to be working and living in beautiful Yeagle country in northern New South Wales. I work as a registered nurse in a rural and remote hospital and often come into contact with youth, young patients who are in distress. So uh, a service that I like to use and refer to my young patients is a, an app on my iPhone called Check-In. This app's been developed by Beyond Blue and what it does is it has two, two purposes. The first one is to point you in the direction of places to go to get support. So there are contact details on there for Lifeline, for Kids Helpline, for Headspace, for eHeadspace, for Reach Out and for Beyond Blue. Not only that, but it also allows you to have a conversation planner. So this is something where if you're really worried about a friend or a family member but don't know how to talk about social and emotional wellbeing issues with them, it takes you through the four steps to plan your conversation so that you feel more confident and comfortable in having those hard conversations. Great to hear from Candice about um, the Beyond Blue check-in app. And I'm going to now introduce our final panellist, Samantha Wild. Um, Sam, someone who has extensive background in working with MOB and mainstream health and wellbeing organisation, 
I've, I've specifically asked Sam to have a bit of a yarn about um, self-care and using digital resources for your self-care. So take it away, Sam. Thanks, Dave. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workforce is something that is really close to my heart and I'm very passionate about our frontline workers um, and what's really important is that we need to keep in the forefront of our minds um, self-care because when we're working in a very challenging space of mental health and, and well-being for our mob, it can be quite tolling on our own um, cultural, spiritual and emotional well-being. So what we know is that our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce is more likely to face extreme stresses such as racism or work environments that do not res respect cultural differences. But there's also this additional press pressure of managing the cultural community and family on the obligations um, as well as work expectations. So digital social and emotional wellbeing resources for self-care can really help provide uh, some perspective and resiliency to be able to support our frontline workforce. So in preparing for this webinar, Dave has asked me to share a couple of resources that I would like to use. And the first one that I'd like to show is the Smiling Mind app. This is um, a very popular mainstream app that provides different meditation practices. Uh, it is an Australian designed app. But the thing that I love about this is that they've translated some of the meditations into traditional language of the Pitanjara, Nanatjara and Creole. So this was developed along, um, developed with the MPY Women's Council in Central Australia. And although I don't speak these traditional languages, when I do meditate, um, I do get a deep sense of renewal of listening to that language as I relax. Um, I also use this app as a way to pause and immerse myself in that connection to culture uh, and to our ancestors. So I highly recommend um, for any of our workforce to trial out that meditation. The other app that I'd like to share is called Curtigy 1.0. And this is really important um, looking at nurturing our cultural and spiritual well-being and this is about um, leveraging those cultural knowledge systems developed by the Walpuri elders to help combat Aboriginal suicide. What's really interesting is that the elders have expressed that this is not just for Aboriginal people, but it's their gift to all Australians. So while they use uh, cultural metaphors, including videos and games and stories to help build cultural resiliency, it is something that is available for everyone. Thanks very much, Sam, for sharing um, those resources on self-care, which we know are important for all our workers out there that work with our mob on, on wellbeing. We're no good if, we, uh, if we're stressed and hung out ourselves, so we've got to practice self-care. So just as a bit of a summary about how to use digital wellbeing resources, we've, we've looked at how you can share them with your clients if you're in a, a counselling or support role and generally as a health promotion tool in your, in your community or with your clients. We've, we've also just seen how we can support our own workforce and Sam's talked about self-care and, and some great apps there, particularly for our Indigenous workers to practice self-care. Um, we hope for our non-Indigenous workers that um, digital wellbeing resources made for and by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are good for your professional development and your cultural awareness. So uh, we appreciate you sharing this journey on the webinar to explore that. So just moving right along because we've only got a few minutes left. Um, a very su quick sum up, we've covered how Indigenous specific wellbeing resources can help us uh, with our clients and with their wellbeing. And we've demonstrated how you can search the one-stop shop of these resources found on the Well, well Mob website. Uh, and we've heard from our amazing panellists about how we can use digital wellbeing resources in our work and uh, with our mob. So it's great for you now to go and explore the WellMob website and think about how you might be able to use it in your work. But before you do, we've got a couple more slides to go. Hang in there. One is just a quick video um, with Uncle Jack Charles talks about the stolen generations and it's um, developed by the Healing Foundation. So we'll just do a quick wrap up after this. So uh, bear with us, please. In the time when our story started, we were able to parent in the cultural way that has seen our family survive and thrive for generations. Our people were strong and our culture flowed and healed us in times of hurt. But since the trauma of colonisation and the stolen generations, 
we have not been able to heal in the same way. And we have unknowingly passed this trauma on to our children through sharing our sad stories and having them witness and experience our pain. This is known as intergenerational trauma. And we see symptoms today in broken relationships, disconnected families, violence, suicide, and drug and alcohol abuse. But this is not where our story ends. We still have strong minds and hearts, and we still know who we were and where we belong by creating safe and strong communities together, supporting our families to be free from pain, returning to our culture and building a strength of identity, we can stop the cycle of trauma and bring about positive intergenerational change so that we can continue to thrive for the next 60,000 years. There are simple things that we can all do to help heal our trauma. Visit healingfoundation.org.au to find out more. A very sobering but inspirational video um, narrated there by Uncle Jack Charles and, uh, and another uh, Indigenous person. Listen, as a thank you for joining us on this webinar, for those of you who have got a clinician role that has a, have a client-based role, we're offering some free calling cards for you to um, contact us in either the um, chat box or through my email address to send some out to you to use with your clients. So you can write on the back the URLs that they need to, to take out of session and integrate within their wellbeing. So a big shout out to Taylor Laurie, who's a deadly uh, Yagel Gumbangi woman that uh, does our Facebook and social media. Please follow us. Um, look for WellMob. Um, you've got the URL there, wellmob.org.au. You need to put HTTPS full colon two forward slashes. And there's my uh, email, d.edwards at sydney.edu.au. Keep in touch. I'd like to thank my deadly three panellists um, for joining me today to, to share with you some of our experiences of uh, using digital wellbeing resources and, and having a bit of a uh, soft sell of the WellMob website um, that we hope you will go away now and explore. Um, please don't forget to fill out your feedback forms uh, and uh, also look for our resource package that can be collected either through that URL or again by putting your smartphone over the QR code. Thanks very much, Sam, Nathan and Tiani for your uh, time and efforts today. And thanks, everyone, for joining us.